site. So we got to do that. And there we go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of staff, council. I see that we have quorum and I call this special meeting for the town of Pelham Council to order. And again, apologies for uh, starting a little bit tardy because of the meeting that we had ahead of time. So apologies uh, to each of you for your, and thank you for your patience. The first item of business is the adoption of the agenda. It has been moved by <coughs> Councillor Kersey that the agenda for the October 11th, 2016 special meeting of Committee of the Whole be adopted. Uh, the clerk has indicated that there, it, there is some additional uh, correspondence here from J and L Adario regarding budget input and J Turple and E McGill regarding budget input. So if we can, maybe I can have a mover to, or a, a person to make the amendment, Councillor Durley, that those items get added as correspondence as 4.4 and 4.5. I'll call the question on the amendment, all those in favor. Any opposed, the amendment carries. Any other amendments to the agenda, are there? So I'm gonna call the question on the amended agenda, all those in favor, any opposed, that motion is carried. Thank you, as amended. The next item is disclosure of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. That is any conflicts of interest that any members of council may have. Do any members have any conflicts of interest? No, that's not true. Okay, can that be so noted that there are no conflicts of interest? The, um, before we begin, I do want to acknowledge and thank, again, members of the public for coming forward with suggestions for the 2017 budget. Uh, we do have uh, five items of correspondence that we're about to, uh, to receive as we work our way through this. This is the... Um, Tenth time I know of that council has gone out to the community to proactively seek input on uh, on the budget process. It's important for us to hear from the community before we start the budget process, so that it, it will help shape our budget as we move forward. So, um, most people uh, talk in in the past. They've talked about things like capital budget items, so roads and and hard things like that, and trails. Um, but also I think council would appreciate input on, uh, you know, other budgets that we have as well, the operating budget and the water and wastewater budget, rate budgets. So thank you very much. And uh, momentarily we'll open it up for members of the public to make presentation. And at that time I will ask you to give us your name, your, um, your municipal address, and then uh, and do so from the podium so that it can be recorded. And then uh, also marked in the in the record here for the clerk to, to keep track of. So it has been moved by Councillor Kersey that the correspondence submitted by A. Bearing regarding the 2017 budget considerations be received for information. Any comments or questions on that correspondence item? There being none, we call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion is carried. We thank Mr. Bearing for that correspondence. It's been uh, moved by Councillor Kersey that correspondence submitted by P. P. Cuchera regarding the 2017, 2017 budget considerations be received for information. Any comments or questions from members of council regarding that correspondence? There being none, I call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion's carried. Council does read these items of correspondence, so <laughs> it's moved by Councillor Kersey. Uh, that the correspondence submitted by Jay Abbott regarding the 2017 budget considerations be received for information. Comments or questions? All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion's carried. It's been moved by Councillor Junkin that the correspondence submitted by Jay and L. Dario regarding the 2017 budget considerations be received for information. Comments or questions? All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion's carried. <coughs> it's been moved by Councillor Durley that the correspondence submitted by Jay Turple and E. McGill regarding the 2017 budget considerations be received for information. And I know that uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Turple is here, and if he wants, he can make a presentation uh, as well. <laughs> so I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion is carried. Thank you. So we appreciate those items, and those will be, uh, Madam Treasurer, what do we normally do with the uh, the correspondence items, if you don't mind, and any other feedback that we get 
from uh, the public this evening? Uh, the, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the, the correspondence items are brought to the, uh, the budget process and considered by individual directors, and then we do communicate back to the residents that provided that information on what, what happened with that during this budget process. Thank you. As well. Thank you. And just to add on that, uh, any, and any presentations that are given this evening, the, uh, the treasurer in her presentation to council and the recommendations that are made on behalf of uh, staff also gives reference to each of those. So we appreciate the feedback. So with all that as a prelude, and your patience uh, is appreciated, now's the time for public input regarding, additional public input regarding the 2017 budget process. Are there any members of the public here that would like to, uh, to present? And I would invite you to come to the, to the podium, uh, state your name, uh, municipal address, and, uh, and give us some feedback. Who's going to be first? You can do that, Dr. Dr. Turple, if you want. Go ahead. You can start it. Yes, please, right here. And give us your name and address. And yeah, uh, Jim Turple. Address is 2133 Hansler Drive, Ridgeville, Ontario, L0S1M0. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, thank you very much, Council, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I wanted to bring, I don't think so much to Council's attention, but, but hopefully for their consideration, an increase towards uh, funding towards trees in our communities. Um, over the last number of years, there's been a lot of loss of trees. That's been for m many reasons, partly development, but largely ash borer, the silver maples that were planted years ago, a lot of them have reached stages in, the, in their life where they're no longer safe, where they're dying, so they've been taken down. Um, I know most municipalities, in, in, including Pelham, tries to maintain a, a tree canopy o over our community. Um, with that, it's, it's somewhat difficult to sort of appreciate how this um, is formulated because you look at a silver maple that's been here for 100 years, and what we do is we plant a tree to replace that silver maple that's been there 100 years. There's no guarantee this tree that we're planting is going to live 100 years. Different municipalities have different ratios of sort of uh, remove trees versus replanting of trees, and they can range from, you know, one in some areas all the way up to five or six if you go to communities that are, that are very, very involved in greening. Um, what I wanted to, to do with respect to the, the council was hopefully um, get some feedback as well, I guess, on the fact that I believe, as well as many other people, that we're not doing enough for replanting the trees in our community. One of the things that makes Pelham absolutely beautiful isn't just uh, the people in Pelham. My wife and I moved here 17 years ago and we could not be happier. We love this town. Our kids have gone to Glen A. Green School, to Crosley, it, it's a great town. Um, and we wanna ensure that it just continues to look that way as well. And it represents everything that the town's about. Um, there's certain areas in the town where there have been a lot of trees taken down and they become more barren areas that they're not certainly as appealing as they once were. Um, you know, the purpose of trees isn't just for aesthetics, although that does help significantly with aesthetics. If you look at our downtown area, um, we have a number of very small trees. There's been trees planted, but unfortunately, we've had a loss of a lot of those trees as well. But if you just stand at the corner of South Pelham and Highway 20 and look south, basically what you see is just hardscape. All you do is you see asphalt, you know, some interlocking brick, um, businesses, buildings. My wife and I also own a number of buildings downtown. Um, and you know, so we, we put an awful lot of uh, time, effort, and, and our life savings into building these places to make them beautiful. But they would be so much more appealing if they weren't just buildings on a street without any trees. Um, so my hope is that we'll be able to make the downtown very appealing and, and as much work as wants to go into it with all of the with all the hardscape with everything that's been done I think it's incredibly important to soften that so that we don't look like a suburb somewhere all concrete all building all asphalt minimal green space so my hope is that we'd be able to um, and and when I when I uh, sort of thought this out I thought you know increase the budget to be honest I don't know what the budget is for trees but I would hope you'd take it into consideration and say there may be more that we can do and in certain areas, certainly. The downtown would be one of those. Um, there's areas where things are growing under the arches, likely the place where they're growing the best and where they're likely needed the least is under the arches, you know, because those arches are actually quite beautiful. Um, but, but trying to support more trees downtown. As well as that, 
um, what I was hoping to do was, from what I can understand, is we do have a bit of an issue with the budget and with trees in the sense that there's two components to the trees. One is actually the capital cost of um, basically getting the trees put in, purchasing the trees, planting the trees, et cetera. But then there's maintaining the trees, and that goes to a maintenance department. And that can put a fair bit more work on their part if you're going to be planting a lot of trees. So one of my proposals was to try and set up a, sort of an association or a committee between, say, that would involve the arborist, the, the maintenance department in the town, and volunteers. Um, volunteers do a number of things. One is it can certainly decrease costs. It can increase survival of those trees because now we're going to be ensured that they're going to get watered regularly regardless of how, how busy the maintenance uh, department is. We can make sure that gets done. And just as importantly, it builds sort of uh, community respect, community trust. It, it just builds a feeling of community. I was involved in tree planting at Glen A. Green School where my children went. When I first approached the school, uh, I wanted to get on the council. And at that point, there was five trees in that property. It's, if anyone knows Glen A. Green, it's a huge back property. And three of those trees were ash, which mm. as of then have actually died. Um, we were met with a fair bit of, there was a number of people that were interested, but we were met with um, a fair bit of opposition. But what happened over the course of two years is we planted about 80 trees on that property. We did it at a very, very, um, with a very small budget. We did a fair bit of fundraising, but what made it the best, truthfully, was the fact that we had all the kids involved. So on days when we'd plant trees, we'd have 60 kids out there, ranging from my son, who would have been in grade two, right up to grade eight. And to this day, you can go out in that schoolyard, now, well, up until about two years ago, you could go out into that schoolyard and you would see kids sitting under the trees that they planted years ago. And, uh, and those kids talk about it all the time. It, it was a, not only a, a great thing for the school, whereas, you know, there's soccer that goes on Saturdays. We started into it because, to be honest, my son was playing soccer, and you go down there Saturday morning to play soccer, and it was like the Sahara Desert. There was no shade. It was brutal. Now you go down there on a Saturday, you'll see kids all over the place sitting under trees that are shade trees. But those kids <coughs> also have taken a lot of pride in what they've done. So when, when I talk about trees going into the community, my hope is that we'd be able to develop some sort of relationship between the town and volunteers that could actually help ensure the success of some of these programs, because I understand that, although you know, we may have the capital to do that, sometimes maintenance can fall short because there's just not enough time. And it's difficult to hire people for shorter periods of time as well. We're talking about, you know, if you, if you get into a fair tree planting endeavor, there's a fair bit of maintenance for the first one to three years. Typically it's watering up trees to ensure they survive. And then once they get past that stage, once they're established, they're, you know, there's going to be a little bit of work. Certainly there's going to be trimming occasionally, that sort of thing. But, but the, most of that is taken care of. And my hope would be that we'd be able to have businesses involved. So in the downtown area, or even if we just look straight out across here where the liquor store used to be, there's a green patch right there. It's just grass, there's no tree there, and all you do is you look at a building. And you know, this is our area where things could look absolutely beautiful. We have a great uh, summer fest that goes on, we have the market that goes on, we have the band shell series that goes on. All that so would be nice to make this area um, more appealing as well as that, even some of the area behind where we do actually have the band shell. Depending on what kind of tree you want, taller trees that have dappled lights so they're not a really thick canopy. But again, to make it very comfortable. People to have somewhere to go and sort of have a picnic, that sort of thing. And setting that up through the town as well. But um, something that I'd be very interested in if the, if the town was willing to um, allocate funds towards us is I'd be very interested in heading the volunteer component of working with the town. And I, I would uh, say to you that I think we'd be very, very successful. I've, I've done it before, we've had great success, and it's, it's great to see that you can bring the whole community together. So we'd be looking at getting right through the spectrum from young kids that are on, most of the schools now have green committees, green teams, getting those kids involved with it at a young age, right through to having potentially seniors and whatnot that are, that are interested in helping out. Um, you know, beautification committees, things like that, where everyone can get involved. And for those kids, I'll tell you, my son and my daughter still talk about, well, and a lot of their friends that I met actually through greening the school property, <coughs> still talk about that day that we did. And they still go back to those trees. My hope is that when they grow up and they come back, because I think a lot of kids do come back to the Fawn Hill area, they're going to be able to say to their kids, you want to know something? 
I remember back in, you know, 2011 when we planted that field. You know, and they go sit under that tree. And that, to me, is it's like the MasterCard commercial, right? It's sort of, it's priceless. That, that's what you want to see. So, so I love the town. Um, I, I think we could work together with the arborist, with, with basically the um, maintenance groups, and try and formulate a plan as to where we could plant some of these trees that may be um, quite valuable to the town. That's it. Thank you very much for your presentation and for uh, sharing your passion. Oh, anyone, does anyone Please. have any questions? I was just going to ask, do any <laughs> members of the council have any questions for Dr. Turkle? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, you've been yeah. very clear and, and uh, we, we appreciate your offer of, um, of helping to head up the volunteer yeah. tier component and yeah. really uh, the way in which you presented and you, and you outlined, you know, I can see it in my mind's eye and I'm sure councillors can as well. Uh, what you're talking about. So. And, and it's not just getting the job done. It's not right. It's not just getting the trees in the ground. Right. It's actually creating something for people that they'll actually look at. They'll appreciate themselves because they're part of it. Because, you know, it's who it was uh, Kennedy that said, right, don't ask, don't ask what your local council can do for you, but what you can do for your council sort of thing. And everything that you invest, you get back many fold over. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks, thanks so much for your presentation. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor Junkin, did you have a question? Uh, just a comment uh, is that we'd be remiss as a council if we didn't point out, uh, and, and the director of public works could uh, fill in the details, that we do have uh, a tree planting uh, process, and I believe it's for every tree we take down, we plant through. Uh, and I'd, I'd probably, uh, obviously, what, what this gentleman referred to is obviously more than welcome, but uh, we are, uh, we do plant trees. Just sometimes uh, with the disease and what have you, they, it may not look yeah. that way, but we do uh, we do uh, do a lot of tree planting in this town as it is. Thank you, thank you, Councillor. Ms. Clementio, are you prepared to um, sort of fill in some of the details, Mr. Dr. Turple didn't say, I know there's a budget, I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, are you able to? Uh, and, and uh, you know, Councillor Junkin talked about the the two for one which is sort of practice as opposed to policy. Council may want to consider looking at that as a policy or not. Um, Madam Tree, Director. Mr. Mayor, sure. We had the policy come forward this year that um, uh, strategically worded that we would strive to replace one for one where we can, um, respecting that there are sometimes unforeseen circumstances like ash where you have large volumes being removed and we can't keep up with replacing the one for one, but throughout the year, anything removed um, in the boulevard for any reason is always replaced. Uh, we work with a an operations budget of um, tree replacement, and I believe it's 75,000 a year. And that goes towards keeping that one-to-one -one replacement going through the year for whatever reason. Um, and we have mm -hmm. a small budget for inspection with outside services and then you might recall earlier this year um, we did come forward for some extra funding to go towards the continued ash removal which we think will last another couple of years um, so that said there's sort of the other side where we're trying to it's funny that you did mention the LCBO property um, there is some potential development there and one of the comments that Public Works had was about greening that green space in the road allowance to make sure um, some plantings happen there, some tree planting, and the arborist gave his um, recommendation on what should be planted there as well. So that's what we're working with, and as you know, the flip side on the operations is us being able to um, maintain the trees, do the mm -hmm. staking, weeding, pruning, watering, and such with the um, resources that we have. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. Anyone else on the topic of trees at the moment? I guess I would add, and, and I know that uh, Dr. Triple knows this, uh, and I'm looking to Ms. Van Raven's way, we did apply for some funding for additional trees. Can you just fill in, uh, remind Council of that, please? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, through the Ontario 150 grant, we did apply for 150 trees um, to commemorate the 150th anniversary. We will find out our success. Um, by the end of December. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> Councillor Pat? Um, through you, can you remind me where are those trees going? Mr. Mayor, 
um, they will be going where we have taken out um, replacement their replacement trees where we've taken out the ash trees but most of them will go into the public parks and our main concern of course is uh, maintaining and watering so um, the priority will be where it's uh, easily accessible to be able to maintain them I <coughs> just uh, again briefly picking up on Councillor Junkin that you're quite right, uh, Dr. Turpel, that across the province, Emmett and College are considered one of the most beautiful streets with the trees that they have. And I think it uh, behooves us to carry on that tradition, and I think we'd like to carry that on. Uh, where I live uh, in a much more modern, you're right, the trees have died. Uh, and I know that the Director of Public Works is trying hard to keep up. We've had beautiful subdivisions built, but quite frankly, uh, the lack of foliage, uh, foliage and that has really been uh, heart. I mean, anybody that walks out knowing the climate change during the summer, the trees are a godsend. So uh, I know I walk my dog and he's panting besides jumping in everybody's pool. Uh, he's also looking for shade and the kids are. So I congratulate you and I know that we take this very seriously on how, uh, what attracts people to our community is that type of commitment to our environment and our climate and our greenery. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. You, well, I guess I'm reluctant because we're going to have other people trying to do that, but uh, <laughs> I think it's something that obviously Council uh, will definitely consider. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillors. Okay. Thank you for that uh, discussion. Um, is there another presenter, Mr. Heska? Oh, sorry. Then I guess Mr. Abbott. Bill uh, Dunn, what, uh, Bill Heska, 8 Bureau Street, Fine Hill, LOS 1 E 0. Uh, I had on my list of items uh, tree replacement. I grew up in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and I worked for Ontario Hydro in their forestry department two summers. So I had some experience in tree removal and tree maintenance. And I put PSRs in and I talked to Andrea about some situations in terms of trees. You don't just randomly put in trees. You've got to be uh, selective in terms of what species you put in in specific locations in terms of soil conditions, uh, proximity to roads, the size of the trees. I know we just had major uh, sidewalk maintenance in Fawn Hill, and I bet you 90% of the sidewalk maintenance is because of tree roots lifting sidewalks. So when I heard a few years, or last year, I guess they were talking about the Comfort Maple, 200 seedlings to plant in Fawn Hill, I just hoped that they're not going to put them on Sopel because they're going to be lifting the sidewalks and you'll be replacing them in a short period of time so you've got to be rational in terms of what you're doing in tree planting don't just and i, I have concern i live on vera street and there's trees and there, uh, there's uh, on stella street there was a number of trees planted and there's there's birch there's maple there's uh, uh, ash that the one is still surviving um, there's uh, several other species and persons have put them right on the boulevard. And the garbage trucks right now are ripping the branches off, the birch trees. Mm -hmm. And last year they went and they replaced or trimmed a bunch of the trees because people were getting slapped in the face on their bicycles. So you've got, if you put trees in, you've got to maintain them. My children grew up in Font Hill and yeah, we looked, I, I was on the council at Glenny Green School and we were pushing for trees at the front. and, and they did finally put them in the back. There was some refusal on that when I was in, on parent council there, but it's 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 required. But you got to be you got to be strategic with where you plant them. You don't you landscape. You don't just rationally drop a tree, seedling in. And I think some areas right now that's what's happened. And you and we're we're, we're going to the town's going to run into some maintenance issues. So I'm just a warning that that you got to be rational in a committee that's uh, community oriented. To go and work on this type of thing, yeah, it's probably possible, but but it's 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 just like other volunteer situations. You've got to go and get. It's got to be a cooperative effort. It can't be one way street. If we talk and nobody listens, it's not going to happen. It's got to be it's got to be a responsive and two way communication. The item I wanted to present to council is a need for a splash pad. I got four grandchildren now and and. Uh, just happened 
uh, last summer we went, and my wife and I took a, the cruise on that um, f uh, schooner that went from Port Colborne to Port Dalhousie, and we went down the canal, and I said, what in the world is this? In Port Robinson, I see a big splash pad there. A splash pad in Port Robinson, what in the world, when did they build that? So we went there and, and saw the facility, and I was amazed. It's probably the best splash, splash pad I've seen in Niagara. It's, it's uh, very, very safety wise, it's set up well. It's, uh, it's powered there, you just hit the buttons and the, there's no power, you just hit the buttons and then the spray goes on and there's buckets. And it's, uh, I don't know when it was, I think it was built about four or five years ago. And uh, it's a very, very uh, efficient and uh, it, it's, 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 it's an excellent facility. And my idea would be possibly adjacent to the pool down the pit or in a more, another area that's close to a, a playground, say at Harold Black Park or something like that. But it's, uh, it's, it's needs, I think there's, there's a lot of young children in the community, grandchildren that visit family. And I think it'd be a, this summer was just a, a summer that there wasn't enough splash pads in, in, uh, in the country for everybody <coughs> to go off. The dogs even too for, for Peter. But, uh, <laughs> you mean for Casey? But uh, no, I think that I think it's a, it's a it's a everybody's building them, the, the splash pads, and I think it's a it's a key item. And I think there's a lot of uh, fundraising and that could be done. But I think it, economically, it's not a, a major investment. It's I, I don't know the, the cost. I'd say probably a couple hundred thousand market at the very most. <coughs> <coughs> thank, thank you very much, Mr. Heska. I, before you go, do any quick members of council have any questions for Mr. Heska regarding those? The, the splash pad I'm referring to is you go down, when you go to Black Horse Corners, go south to the dead end there, or when you got to go right. Can be if you go right, you drive right into the, into the splash pad. It backs onto the, onto the uh, uh, well, well and Canal. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think there, there's that uh, former, or that, well, it's not former. It's a park. Yeah, there's a park uh, in, there in and, uh, it's, it's kind of a lower area. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's right. It's right close yeah, we'll to the to road in the out. high area, and there's open field in behind in that, and there's a very large parking area. But it's uh, that's all that's there right now. There isn't even a, a ball diamond or even uh, playground equipment at this point in time. It's probably going to be developed, but it's a it's a, a, a beautiful facility in terms of uh, uh, safety and and uh, accessibility. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Heska? Thank you for the for the presentation and the comments about trees and also the idea for a splash pad. One of the items of correspondence from uh, P. Kuchera, um, item 4.2, is about a splash pad and, and uh, suggesting, as you suggested, Mr. Heska. So thank you very much for that. I see other members of the public here. Uh, would, you, would you like to come forward? and? <coughs> Ladies first, Mr. Abbott, and then we'll get you next. How's that sound? <laughs> it's Sandy Gibson, uh, 5 Sherry Lee Crescent, Fong Hill. Um, I'm here on behalf of Palum Minor Baseball. Um, we just hosted our AGM on October 3rd, so I'm the new president. Congratulations, so, uh, and thank you for uh, serving as president. I don't know if congratulations are <laughs> 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 Anyway, so um, I'm not um, as prepared as I'd like to be. Um, we have a wish list for Pella Minor Baseball, so I know this is not all going to uh, be in the 2017 budget, okay. if any, but um, we have a few um, ideas. Um, for safety reasons, um, at our beautiful new Centennial Diamond Number 3 and Harold Black, we would like bullpens. Um, a bullpen would consist of a six-foot section of chain link fence to be put behind a back catcher. Um, these are for the pitchers to warm up in between innings and on where the pitcher would stand would be an elevated um, dirt so it would be housed by three sides of uh, railroad ties or pressure treated lumber and that would be the pitching mound. So we would need two um, at each diamond so that would be four. So that would, that would we would really um, like that in 2017. It's a safety issue because the pitcher uh, warming up, um, stray balls go flying and they tend to hit um, pedestrians mm. or uh, fans. Um, and at Centennial 2, a few years ago, you graciously put in some lights. 
Uh, however, the diamond is uh, set up for slow pitch, and uh, I'm not sure, but I, this summer, didn't see any slow pitch being played at Centennial 2. Um, we, baseball is growing thanks to the Blue Jays, and um, I'm anticipating uh, with the new housing being built on Rice Road uh, that we'll have a lot of new uh, ball players this summer. Mm. So we're wondering if we could, to improve that diamond, um, firstly we would like the grass cut out to make the infield just a little bit bigger to uh, enable our Pee Wee players to play there, um, but also um, some netting. Um, which would prevent fall balls from going to the adjacent properties. Um, balls are uh, about $5 each, and we tend to lose quite a few during games and practices when we do use that field. Um, I'm not sure of the cost. I, as I said, I'm not very prepared. Uh, so those are the two things for Centennial 2. Um, a little thing we need is um, our lock boxes that we keep our bases and pitching machines in. We're going to get a new one uh, for Centennial 1 and uh, North Pelham. Um, a few years ago we had one at Centennial 2 and we had it um, secured by a chain and it, somebody came and cut and we lost our $500 box. So uh, we had a cement pad port at Centennial 3 and we had um, screws, anchors put in and then we secured the box and cut holes in the box and put it down so it's not going to be able to be removed. So we'd like a pad for a new box at North Pelham and one at um, Centennial 1. And thank you for our beautiful new field, Centennial 3. This is the first summer that we used it and with the help of Jesse we were kind of fi uh, fixing a few little uh, problems but um, some time would be nice to have lights at that field too. <laughs> um, so after 17. <laughs> yeah, and Harold Black as well. Harold Black is our bantam and midget diamond. And we were approached by Niagara District Baseball to host a, a Niagara District bantam team. However, we had to decline because one of the requirements is the lighted diamond because we would be hosting teams from uh, the Toronto area. Mm. So we would have to have later starts and we wouldn't be able to have that without lights. And um, another small thing would be maybe to close in the dugouts, the new dugouts that were built at Harold Black and Centennial 3. Um, it allows uh, players to hang up um, their batting stuff and uh, uh, rain and um, sunshine we can put up some shelter. And um, I know Vicky's aware of this, but we are applying for a Trillium grant. We are uh, looking to build a batting cage <coughs> at Centennial Park. Um, I believe the town gave support. So uh, just looking for cooperation on that project. Hopefully we, everything will go through with the Trillium grant. I'm not sure. But, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, do members of council have any questions? Perhaps, uh, I, I know the clerk was feverishly typing here, it, it may be helpful as well if you could just put it in a, an email, in an email or sure. a list as well. Yeah, it is a, it is a big wish list, but uh, yes, I do love my baseball. <laughs> do, you have, do you have a piece of paper that you can share with the clerk right now, or is it uh, kind of your scratchings and you'd like to add to it? Thank you. Okay, great, thank you very much. And so Diamond 3, um, it's a it's a good diamond. I was wondering about that. It, oh yes, yeah. That's Centennial. These this summer and it's beautiful. Good, very um, good. Hopefully, um, we didn't have much rain this year, so we didn't really test out how well it drains. Mm -hmm. But uh, hopefully, that won't be an Quite issue. Quite a big ditch behind it, and uh, <laughs> and a big berm to the to the uh, north of it. So yeah, yeah. But we we enjoyed it this summer. So. Good. Thank you so much for your presentation and, and congratulations again on uh, your election and uh, thank you for your service to the community. <laughs> Other members of the public? Oh yes, Mr. Abbott, sorry. No, I momentarily, <laughs> momentarily, sorry. And thanks again for the uh, item of correspondence as well. Uh, yes. Uh, and your work name work and address, just so the... Work up to that. Uh, yes, my name is John Abbott. I live on Pickwick Place, number nine, and I've been a resident of Font Hill for 
long four years, a wonderful four years. But uh, I have to say at the outset that Dr. Turple and I don't know each other. We have not connived on anything here, <laughs> but it seems that we're all on beautification and trees. And it's very so interesting. I, I'm, I'd like to address that as well. Please. Um, Councillor Kersey has been uh, the unlucky recipient of a, of a couple of letters <laughs> on, on my part with copies to you as well, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And um, I'm not sure which one is listed on the agenda. I have an idea that it is the one dealing with trees. Yeah. Yes, it is. is that correct? Yeah. It's a one-pager, I understand. So you, you, reference the lights, you reference the lights, but it's the, uh, the trees. Yes. Go ahead. I wonder if I could back up a bit and explain why I think we can uh, knock two balls out of the, if, since we're dealing with baseball as well, two balls out of the park at the same time. Okay. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> while I've only been on the street for about four years, I've been living with, residents who have lived there for almost 25 to 30 since the street Pickwick place started and um, I listened to their tales of frustration and essentially the frustration uh, is focused on maintaining the median uh, in a way that looks beautiful and adds continues to add charm to the street um, and generally, I suppose you might say selfishly as well, adds market value to the houses up and down the street. It's quite a unique street. Mm -hmm. Most of you probably know it. Uh, we were amazed to find it uh, when we came in uh, to Font Hill four years ago, and uh, we thank our lucky stars that we have. It's a, it's a wonderful street. It's quiet. It's beautiful. Um, and uh, it's a very uh, cohesive neighborhood, the 11 houses that are on it. Uh, I'm pleased to say that in addressing the median, and particularly the street lights, we've been working with town, town staff, through engineering, public works engineering, and I think successfully. We asked upon hearing in 2014 that there were going to be some changes to the median, we asked to be plugged in, to be kept them informed, and that we would like to participate in any planning that was to take place. Uh, much to our surprise, in 2015, uh, there was no comment about the median shrubbery, the trees, the junipers, and the pines, but the lights were going to be replaced. That surprised us. Uh, nevertheless, we said we'd like the, uh, the communication to continue how will the lights look? Um, this year, about uh, three months ago, we were given the option of lights, this one or that one. Not much of a choice, but at least a choice. The pole, this one or that one. And uh, all of the street got together, and I did submit a letter indicating uh, which we would like to engineering, and that was understood. Then, uh, much to our great surprise, uh, we found that the lights that were going to be put in place were going to be 25 feet high. Well, the current lights are 11 feet high. Uh, there are many islands on the, on the uh, street itself. Uh, the width of, of the street on each side of the islands is only 18 feet. And uh, we were aghast, frankly. We said, my God, you know. Um, 25 feet on a street like that with hardly any traffic. It's intrusive, unnecessary in our view. We rather like the lights the way they are, but nevertheless, engineering has determined that there should be better lights, so, so be it. We'll go with that. So our first letter, and I will lead up to the second one in a moment, uh, really dealt with the size of the lights, and we asked for a minor variance. Engineering uh, has been cooperative. They understand our concerns, but they say they're hamstrung, that uh, the street lighting standard is from 25 to 50 feet. A pedestrian lighting standard is from 10 to 25 feet. We're saying, look, <laughs> you know, we're really not a street in the true sense of the word. 
um, and we'd like something 16 or less as a minor variance. Now, I'm not sure when that those lights are going to be put in place, but when they are put in place, there will be damage certainly to the median and the median shrubbery. At this point in time, there are five trees, I think they're cherries, flowering trees, sitting in the median. Four are dead. One is alive, fairly, you can tell it's a young tree. <laughs> it flowers beautifully. It looks as if it's been well taken care of. The other four should go. They are really looking miserable. And this is what the second letter deals with. I mean, this is a very low cost item. Mm -hmm. But believe me, uh, from everything I've heard on the street, there have been <laughs> many attempts over a number of years to try to get the median back in shape the way it used to be uh, some 15 years ago. So it's a very low cost opportunity, I think, for beautification. It deals with trees. Uh, as part of uh, as part of my um, my pitch here, I was I didn't know I was going to do this, but I will volunteer for Dr. Turple's volunteer group. <laughs> That's great. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> if I can get four new trees, love it. You're on. You're, you're on. on. You're on. I really just want to say sold. I mean, I love you know. it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Bring it on. <laughs> so that's really uh, that's really what I'm here for. It's not a very big item relative to other things that are going on in town and even outside the town, but it is important to uh, the 11 members of the street, mm -hmm. and uh, it has been for quite some time. So if we can move on it, uh, it would be much appreciated. Thank you so much for your presentation. Just before you go, I don't know if any members of council have any questions from the very patient Mr. Abbott. You've been very clear. Thank you so much. We appreciate it, and uh, <laughs> I'm hoping we can work together with you. It is a beautiful street uh, that you live on. And uh, I'll give Dr. Turbo my address. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. That's really the kind of community that we have, yeah, the community spirit that we have, so thank you for that. Other members of the public with a presentation or a request, a suggestion? And if you could state your name and address, please, sir. Good evening. Uh, Larry Dolan, 53 uh, Klein Crescent here in Font Hill. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to uh, share a couple of ideas with you. I'll be relatively brief. Uh, the first item, and it's, it's relatively a, a minor cost item, and uh, it has to do with street signage here in Pelham. Several years ago, the region moved to um, street signs that were more legible and, and visible, namely the blue signs with uppercase and lowercase lettering in them. And most of the other communities in Niagara have also migrated to that standard. However, here in Font Hill, and actually it came to my attention when I saw, Mr. Mary, your photo in the paper with the new uh, development and, and the sign that uh, you're holding, and it was the old format, the green sign with mm -hmm. all uppercase letters, which is really not conducive in these days with, uh, as far as for seniors and whatever people with any kind of mm -hmm. visual problems. And uh, so I thought there was a bit of an embarrassment when I saw that, to tell you the truth. Just the format of the sign, mm -hmm. not, the, not the idea, the concept behind the sign. That's fair. And uh, so I just thought that I realized we can't migrate all our street signs at once. But it's, it would be my idea or suggestion that uh, as signs become necessary, that we migrate to this other standard. And I urge you, if you are traveling throughout the region, whether it's in Welland or Niagara Falls, you'll see the kind of street signage that they are using. Minor item, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The other item, and it kind of falls in with this whole tree thing. Another volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> wait till I gotcha. finish. Wait till I finish. <laughs> and uh, it's something that uh, it comes to mind as I, as I walk the town, and I, I see the, the number of projects that uh, have taken place in town over the years, whether it be the Hay Street redevelopment and the recent work that was done along Highway 20, and the, the unsightly overhead wires that... Um, are still in place. And I think it was it's relatively unfortunate that something couldn't have been done about burying those 
overhead utilities at the time when um, the construction was taking place. And so um, my suggestion would be to see uh, perhaps a line item entered into the, your budget process. I'm not sure if there is one at the moment. And I realize you can't be looking at bearing cables or under utilities on an annual basis, but if there could be some sort of reserve fund that could be put aside so that that could be addressed as the uh, opportunity arises in the future. And that would help, help our canopy as well here. In, uh, in hmm. Thank you very much for your any suggestions. Questions? Do members of council have any questions? No. Oh, very, good. Oh, very clear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mr. Dolan. Is that correct? Dolan, yes. Dolan. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Dolan. Some great ideas. Sir, are you going to make a presentation? <laughs> Mike is <laughs> Okay. Thank you. And your name and address, please. Uh, my name is Mike Athey uh, from 20 White Hall Gate in Font Hill. I've uh, been a resident of this town for two and a half years, previously residing in Oakville uh, since I came to Canada in 1977. One of the reasons for coming down here to this beautiful little town was to get away from the darn congestion in Oakville, Mississauga, and generally the GTA. And I am very concerned that we're getting more and more congested. Mm. We've got this new facility going in down the road here, which is going to lead to, I'm sure, more traffic. So I would advocate, wherever possible, to use roundabouts instead of traffic lights. There was an abundance of roundabouts in England, and they save so much congestion because you don't have to stop. So in this day and age when gas is so expensive, and we're concerned about the environment. We don't want, cars want to be moving all the time. Mm -hmm. So I know it's not always possible. There's restrictions where properties already exist, but there are lots of places where provision could be made for putting in roundabouts. So I would urge that for any further development, we look at that possibility and uh, try and ease the congestion or reduce the congestion. So it's basically what I wanted to say anyway. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay. Do members of council have any questions or comments? Uh, Councilor Papp? <clears throat> just, uh, just by what you've seen in the town itself, where would you think, in your opinion, would a roundabout be suitable? Um, the one place that would sort of probably lend itself at the moment is uh, Effingham and 20. Uh, there's a lot of work going on there at the moment, and there's, <coughs> I know that on the north side there's some restriction, but on the south side there's a lot that's presently for sale. Um, the Rice Road in 20 would have been a nice place to have put something <laughs> up if we hadn't already put the pond in. <laughs> so they're the two <coughs> things I can think of uh, off the bat. Um, but um, even the intersections with... Uh, um, 406 and 20. Uh, there's no reason why they couldn't have roundabouts there. Mm -hmm. um, right. Ease any congestion mm -hmm. there so you can straight off and roundabout and on you go, whichever way you want to go. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you. I can <coughs> look at other areas and yeah, see. I know in, in town itself it's very difficult. But, uh, so if, if I might just build on that with a question, Mr. Mr. Athey. Um, Sometimes when roundabouts are built, like the one at the end of 406 in East Main, or I don't know if you're familiar with the one on Highway 55 in Niagara and the Lake, there's some new roundabouts. They're quite, they're quite large. Yes. So going down the highway past the airport and into Niagara and the Lake, past Virgil, et cetera, they're, they're very large. And the areas, the intersections you described are large intersections. Are there not also smaller roundabouts that we don't, we don't often <coughs> Seem to build. There, there so you, you spoke of yeah you spoke and, of and coming from in Europe. Oakville, they, this was a bone of contention with council in Oakville as well, and they did uh, <coughs> build some roundabouts within new developments. Mm -hmm. yes. So instead of putting stop signs, yeah. they had just a small roundabout. For most of the time, you're dealing with small cars. Right. Now the problem on highways is that you're dealing with 
<laughs> semi tractors and, and right. tractors with trailers and they have a difficulty getting around a very small roundabout mm -hmm. and one of the things they used to do I go back to my England days in those situations for for large loads they would have a straight through barrier on the roundabout something that could lift a gate and mm. on special occasions Which, where mm -hmm. they needed to mm -hmm. but um, uh, for small developments and uh, where you're normally dealing with just small vehicles mm -hmm. a small roundabout is more than you know it can be 10 15 feet diameter and it still lends people to blend in rather than having to stop and wait for lights and right. twiddle the thumbs and get on the get on the cell phone you know, <laughs> text while they're waiting so. thank you that's that's helpful um, I know for instance the region's um, position on intersections is they say that they always look at the intersection first if it's possible to do a roundabout so uh, you you referenced uh, Effingham in 20 when that was prior to that being done I did say can we do something here and they said again because of the topography etc land you know you raise the option of land acquisition but at that point they said you know probably not we couldn't do it so that's why they put in that intersection the region is redoing um, or looking at redoing Rice Road and undertaking an environmental assessment right now and I've encouraged them to take a look at Port Robinson and Rice Road as a potential roundabout a lot of traffic there and everybody just seems to stop and then carry on yes and Quaker Road it's not in Pelham but but Quaker and Rice Road yes which yes. there's a lot of traffic through there in front of the um, the school board building that pe yeah. and near the mm -hmm. school yeah. and, I, I just uh, think I, that I, it, it should be a consideration right. before we go putting lights in I mean lights take maintenance and they take power to run even though we go to LEDs they still take power to run mm -hmm. whereas with a roundabout you've got the initial investment but then it's just uh, it's it's there, and yes, it needs maintenance periodically. But it's not the same as a 24-hour-a-day cost to run. Mm -hmm. Very good. And and some of the um, sections of the road that uh, where did he go back in the in the back? Mr. Dolan spoke about um, Summersides Boulevard. There will be roundabouts built into that exactly um, to try to help. But they're smaller ones. Yes. So. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very much for your presentation and for your idea and, and encouragement. I know that uh, having spoken to staff, I know that uh, they are talking about it, um, and I'm pleased you're raising it to, uh, to uh, council's consciousness as well. Anyone else? Is that everybody? Oh, Mr. Heska, for a second time. <laughs> I got another comment further to the roundabouts and that. I, okay. I was in, moved to Hamilton in 73, and they still had the Stony Creek traffic circle. And if you ever experienced that traffic circle when the Stelco and DeFasco and all industries in Hamilton, it was like suicide circle. I saw more coils of steel come off trucks on that <laughs> traffic circle than I saw accidents. And you just got to be very, and I know in Bimbrook they put a traffic circle. Hmm. And I traveled that road many times with, when I was working full time going to Brantford. And that traffic circle is so small. The it's trucks true. go straight through, mm -hmm. and you've got to be rational. You've got to be very selective where you put them, mm -hmm. and you don't make them yeah. 10 feet in diameter and expect the truck that's 53 feet trailer to go through that traffic circle. You got to. Yeah. It takes Thank room. You. It takes more room than a, a, a traffic light or stop stop intersection to put a traffic circle in. So you got to be selective. But one, my concern right now is the amount of heavy traffic traffic going through Highway 20. There needs to be something done in terms of traffic flow going on Highway 20 and South Pelham, truck traffic coming from the quarry. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous in terms of the number of trucks. And I, thankfully, nobody's got hurt along Highway 20. We're going to put a sidewalk along there. But I know those trucks are coming out of that quarry and gravel's on the side of them. Gravel's going to come off and somebody's rocking that sidewalk and get hurt. But you, it, it, there's got to be something. There's trucks going, and we've got to find out where they're trucking to. If they're trucking to the development, yes, go use Highway 20. If they're trucking to Niagara Falls or Niagara on the Lake, go go an alternate route, not through the main town. Mm -hmm. okay. There's something got to be done in terms of trucks, and the trucks are not getting smaller; they're getting bigger. They're putting tandem trailers behind these trucks. And my neighbor, he trucks from Vineland to Toronto every day. 
and he's hauling 60 ton on that truck. Okay, and it's and it's not a it's it's a train. Yeah, going through the town, you can feel it vibrating. It's and it's destroying our roads too. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be all the injury. The roads are not built. If, if a road's going to hand, handle those trucks, it's, it's got a concrete base that's probably 12 inches thick plus 8 inches of asphalt on top of it, which is a wear strip. But you got to have a base, and we don't have the roads around here. You're building on quicksand and sand going through Font Hill. you got to make sure you build the roads for the trucks, and, and it's just it's, 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 it's a major issue that we got to go and look at. Thank you very much, Mr. Aska. I think that's everybody. Sir, are you? No, you're, you're together, so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for your, for your input. Um, greatly appreciated and a good conversation that we actually had uh, this evening, I think. Um, common theme about wanting our town to be improved, which is wonderful, uh, beautified, um, whether it's at a larger scale or on a street scale, uh, roundabouts and traffic and things like that, and, and as well um, from, uh, you know, the sports, sports groups as well, to, again, to, to make it a great community. So on behalf of Council, I want to say thank you very much to each of you for making your presentations this evening, for giving us uh, some suggestions, uh, some concrete uh, in quotes, and some... Um, a little bit other things that we should consider. So I greatly appreciate it on behalf of members of council you coming out this evening and as well those that uh, wrote us letters. The There is an email address, I think it's ourbudget at pelham.ca that you can, folks can, uh, can send in uh, additional items to us. There's also something called Play Speak, I think. Um, is it closed? It was closed for the agenda. Oh, it was closed for the agenda, okay. so. Uh, if there are folks that are interested, if there's others you talk to that are interested in uh, in participating and giving some additional uh, feedback to council, that our budget at pelham.ca will make sure that it, it gets and to uh, to staff, and uh, they can recommend to council. Uh, where are we now? So I think that's it. Other than uh, where are we on the agenda? There we go. Thank you very much. So that, that was input from the public. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And now we turn to if there is any input from members of council on any additional items for the 2017 budget. I am going to call on the treasurer to just give us an update. Sometimes uh, when we have done this, Madam Treasurer, either at this point or in the future, you're, you know, you've given us uh, an update on where we're at with various cost items. Can you give council an understanding of when that would occur? Uh, the budget impact items here for uh, November 14th at 630. You can uh, stay if you want, but you can also leave. So thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to take down trees or put trees in. Oh. Thank you. Uh, so on November 14th at 630, there is a special meeting of council for budget input uh, from staff. And this will provide council with what we know are the uncontrollable it items that are affecting the 2017 budget. Um, there will also be a pre uh, presentation from the uh, CEO of the library, which will present their budget request needs for 2017 as well on that evening. Um, some discussion about permissive grants or municipal grants um, and that evening as well. And then more input from Council with respect to where the budget's going for 2017, some, some guidance from Council. And the first budget will be presented in uh, at the last meeting in November, the last Monday in November, with Council consideration for adoption. Um, in the first week of December, and that is the capital budget. And then again, we, we do the operating budget last week of January with Council's consideration for approval first week of February. And then the water and wastewater budgets, thank you. The yes. water wastewater budgets are later in February and the early March. The water wastewater bu budgets will come as a report to Council in late February. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Madam Treasurer, for that update. Um, so we, we do look for that budget impact uh, coming up on middle of November, the 14th of November. But is there any, I'm turning to Councillor Kersey because he and I had a conversation, you may want to raise it now. Um, any other input from members of Council? Councillor Kersey, I'm going to um, turn to you and Councillor Papp, or Councillor Papp first, who wants to go sure, first? whatever you like. Councillor Papp. All right, <clears throat> I just uh, want to share a couple of themes that I heard tonight. One is we definitely should pursue and flush out the engagement and development of a volunteer group to assist us in certain projects. Mm -hmm. uh, besides what he was talking about, tree replacement, very quickly I can tell you, 
there's a volunteer group that works with our staff, uh, Public Works, on Rhodes Court. They have maintained that cul-de-sac beyond, it's simply beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that gives you another one. The other thing that comes out of this is very quickly, um, the Pelham Baseball, when I heard about the tournaments and the lighting, it became obvious this year Harold Black increased in activity. There were some softball tournaments and I walk through there every day. And if there's an opportunity for us to invest in some infrastructure that would attract those types of tournaments, that would just build upon our whole, if you know what I mean, on a general theme, attract people in for that. And then finally, um, you recall back a little ways ago, uh, I was not here at the time, but anyhow, Dominic Ventresca and Mr. Rappelje talked to you about aging in place strategies. A lot of the things that Mr. Dolan was talking about, signage and ab application, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. those are strategic areas that I know that I'm involved in another aspect of work. I actually sit on that committee. Some of the communities, uh, and I think I would like to see us as being a leader, is as we develop and build and rebuild, that we take into consideration that type, whether it's signage, adaption of physical infrastructure for our seniors population. I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Those are just sort of strategic priorities and thrusts well, to and help. And just to build on Thanks, that, Mr. Councilor, Mayor. thank you. Just to build on that, the last one, Councilor, that was something that was added to the strategic yep. plan. Mm -hmm. um, so, so something to consider. Yeah. No, I, I agree, but I wanted to let Mr. Yep. You know, we'll get a chance to let the general public know we've right. included in the, in the strategic plan that the aging in place is going to become part of our raison d'etre mm -hmm. as we move forward. And I think in addition to the, thank you, and, but in addition to the strategic plan, one of them is also talking and working with volunteers. Yep. as a priority a for 2017 example. and um, so Rhodes Court is a good example and I I think this came through with Ridgeville I know the shop owner in Ridgeville yeah they did um, at the beautification or the um, award ceremony we had she said I love what you're doing with with the beautiful area in Ridgeville and my shops right there and I try to beautify things is there some way that I can help out and so she volunteers to help out with the corner patch there where the sign is and so there's a lot of folks that are quite interested in, in, as we know, our community is one of great volunteers. So there's a lot of folks that, that really want to, uh, to embrace the beautification across town. So thank you for raising it in, in that capacity and informing us about Rhodes Court as well. Councillor Kersey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had a, a few things down just to speak them in, uh, to them in sort of high level terms. Uh, so I'll just go through them in no specific order. Uh, permissive grants to me are a continual source of aggravation and grief uh, to both this council, to our staff, and, and for that matter, to the community. Uh, we need to resolve this, uh, and maybe the resolution is to do away with it and come up with some other way of supporting our uh, service groups, because I really think that's an area that we need to support, but uh, we need to, the system is broken. We've tried our best to, re, to improve it. We've made some improvements, but those improvements, there are ways of getting around those improvements that, to the point where it, it loses its, its efficacy. And then throughout the year, we continually see requests come forward and we continually roll over and hand out those requests despite the fact that we, our permissive grant strategy and, and uh, policy says specifically when and how those, those applications are to be dealt with. So uh, I think we need to, to have a hard look at that and perhaps this council and staff can put our heads together and come up with a, a policy that uh, we can go forward with. Another thing that uh, kind of... We'll see if we can just to build on that. Yeah. We'll see if we can schedule that for the 14th of November, mm -hmm. I think is what the unless you want to try it earlier. Um, it's something I think we do need to have yeah. an open and frank yeah. discussion about, well, Mr. I Mayor. Think, I don't I think know we can do a mini creative problem solving process. That might be a way of, of getting to the brunt of it. Okay. Um, Sorry, Councillor, go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, another thing that, that kind of always boggles my mind a little bit is <clears throat> how we decide on what capital projects we're going to undertake and what what gets prioritized, and that's in any area. Um, you know, we, we've said when we adopted the idea of going ahead with the community center, we said that we would only go forward with projects, capital projects that were absolutely essential. And, uh, and yet at times during the course of the year, we, we drop projects because they're 
suddenly no longer a priority and we can direct those funds to something else and, and what have you. And that seems to me that as we continually do that, we undermine our 20-year plan of uh, asset management. Um, we undermine our, our uh, concept of building up reserves. Um, and I think that's something that we have to be very cognizant of as we move forward, that we're undertaking a very significant project, uh, something that will transform our community, hopefully, and, and that we're going to bring it in on time and on budget, and I'm, I'm assuring Council that we will. But having said that, we also have to plan for the future for the rest of the community, and part of that, a big piece of that, is the reserve, bud the reserve budget. And so when we strike a capital budget, we should be striking a capital budget that is based on some specific criteria that Council has adopted, whether it's by way of policy or by way of, of um, procedure, that we, we can look at that, that capital project in whichever department it comes forward in and know that it has been prioritized based on a certain uh, well, we have scheme. A certain plan that you know is it health and safety is a priority. Uh, second, maybe uh, preventing further breakdown of the asset. Dot 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 dot. It's it's something that I'm sure if we looked at the private sector uh, and property management that 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 is out there, we could uh, unveil a, a plan that that we could apply to our budgets uh, with respect to capital and how we how do we manage ca uh, cost overruns in capital projects and yet still have a very solid uh, movement towards healthy reserves because, right. okay, so let's say a project goes over, where do we get the money? If it hasn't been budgeted, it's got to come out of the reserves. So now you're, you've depleted and, and damaged your next year's capital projects that you've, you've projected. So I think we need to develop some sort of criteria on how we manage those situations. I think one thing we don't use significantly in our processes and uh, is a, an RFI, a request for information, where there are projects that are beyond the scope of, of the in-house expertise that we could go out to the public sector and get input from them prior to putting together the capital budget so that when we bring those capital budgets together and the numbers that we bring to the table, we can have some reliance that they'll be either slightly over budgeted or at least within the realm of possibility. So I, I won't belabor that, but I think we need some work, some work to be done around that. Um, with respect to the operating budget, I, I and I'm reading between the lines, but there have been a significant number of reports that have come Councilor, forward. Can I? Oh, sorry, Mr. Mayor, go ahead. Um, I know that staff are working on sort of the evaluation criteria for the capital budget and capital items. Um, and so I'm just going to ask the CAO to just quickly comment on where they are in that process and um, how that's going to come to Council for our, for our consideration. Mr. CAO. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We did do an evaluation uh, of the capital projects last year as uh, SMT. We did it as a group. Um, we established the evaluation criteria and we evaluated the, the capital projects and we did present that to Council. Um, I think where, so that's that's what we do. Where the issue, where where the issue comes in is when our criteria doesn't match the criteria, the evaluation criteria of what the council is is, is suggesting. And that's what I'm hearing tonight is that council may have their own criteria for evaluating. So if that's the case, let us know and we'll use that criteria. That's not a problem. Uh, but we are getting into that process of of trying to evaluate capital projects and determine which ones are essential and which ones are not. Um, but the, 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 the caution is, is that if we rank, uh, if we do an evaluation criteria and we or an evaluation of the budget, we bring that in, um, council may look at the evaluation and say, well, I would, you know, I would rank that different or I would rank this different. And then you get into the situation of council <laughs> applying the criteria and evaluating um, their own capital projects, um, which, fly. which, on the fly, but it also sort of undermines or negates all the work that the senior management team has done. So we need to, to me, that's the point we need to reconcile between administration and council. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we could have that criteria, that would be awesome for us. It would really help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I might think, I know, Council Papp, you want to comment on that? Go ahead, I'll, and then I'll No, no, I'll be able to comment. I couldn't Go agree ahead. more. Both of you have a great, you know, what it says to me is you need a joint understanding 
of yes. what the criteria is yeah. in the corporation. Mm -hmm. With all due respect to staff and all due respect, I've been on both sides, that's what basically we're saying. Mm -hmm. So we're not working in opposition, we're working in unison yeah. on what we consider to be the guiding principles of how we want to establish a capital budget. Mm -hmm. And there's some, which I don't, I'm not going to look at carry, oh, sorry, uh, some are mandatory. We, you can't get around it. You've got to do some of this stuff. Those that are discretionary, I think that's where Councillor uh, Kersey's going, that we, uh, and some we personalize, but right. not, I think it'd be worth our while, Mr. Mayor, just to go through a sort of a educational hall might and say, okay, when we're going to be doing capital evaluations, what are you guys looking at? What do we think we are? And that should be the, that should be the standard, yep. if you want to call it. And how we come to mm -hmm. the disagreements will come into probably financing, timing, all the rest. And I'm, I don't want to elaborate, but I mean, yes, the fact yeah. is that's yeah. that's where we're getting. That's where we get frustrated. Yeah. And of course, any public pressure. And I, I don't want to use a couple of projects that we did mm -hmm. decide to proceed one project that it, that if you really in reality wanted to look at it, you probably wouldn't have done it. We probably other theorists would have said you shouldn't have done that. But sometimes things are done for historical and political reasons, and that's the nature of our business. So I would ask that maybe we do that mutual session, yeah, Mr. Mayor. I think that'd be worth our while, and then find out what you're looking at, and you look find out what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yeah. No. Exactly. So um, just just to that, I think yeah, there's there's the evaluation criteria of uh, does it meet our strategic plan or the priorities of strategic plan is part of it as well. So I'd like to see yeah, that that's included. What I'm at. I just mentioned to the clerk is that something um, that we might do. Uh, as a creative problem solving process next Monday at PNP. So we'll see what the schedule looks like. If it isn't then, we'll have to figure out a time to do it. I think November 14th is too late, yeah. but I don't think oh. uh, tonight's the night to do that either. But if, um, so, so Councillor Junkin and I, as we do the review for the agenda for Monday with staff, we'll see if we can maybe schedule a time in the PNP meeting. Uh, in order to do that, That'd be right. That'd be if exactly. that's okay with uh, yep. council, it, it so the CAO did indicate it was a process used last year, and you know I think um, it, it'll be good to to give an update now that we've gone through that process. So we'll we'll try and do that on the uh, whatever the date is, seventeenth, I guess. Yep. Okay. Anyone else to that? Okay, Councillor Kersey, you said you had another item. I, or, uh, yeah, two, two other comments, okay, go Mr. Ahead. Mayor. Uh, Thank you. With respect to the operating budget, um, there's been several reports come forward that have me quite concerned. Uh, one of our largest costs of operating the community is staffing and bringing permanent staff on board because not only do you have to pay the salary, you have the legacy costs that are attached to it. Mm -hmm. And it gives me great concern that that we're hearing that from our staff that we're understaffed, that uh, certain projects can't be undertaken effectively uh, with the present staff that we have. I haven't heard a whole lot about looking at other alternatives and, and I, I would just encourage staff to look at other alternatives such as using volunteer groups for maintenance, uh, of, you know, own a road type of thing, own a garden, uh, the things Dr. Turple has put forward where we provide support, but the volunteers do the grunt work and get out there and, you know, they take ownership of it. Mm -hmm. It builds community. Mm -hmm. We have a wonderful community with respect to volunteers. I think we can mm -hmm. leverage that to to bring not only beauty to the community, but to save significant dollars. I think contracting out also offers some great opportunities. Uh, we have a great staff. I'm not belittling our staff in any way, shape, or form, and I'm talking frontline workers to the very top. Uh, my my vision is that those those staff can become experts in their field. They can become the supervisory component <coughs> of the project, the oversight component of the project, but the actual physical work, et cetera, could be done by contracting out. You don't have the long-term con mm -hmm. contractual obligations. So they don't do the they don't perform. They're gone. Mm -hmm. Whereas you hire an individual, and we all know we've been there, done that, where we have to make decisions, it costs the town dearly. So I just am putting it out there for consideration 
take a look at the alternatives i would hope when we get a budgetary request that we can hear clearly that those alternatives have been looked at and what the implications are and why why one has been chosen over another i think that's in fairness to council and who make the ultimate decision but also in the community to understand why we've undertaken a particular position so i'll stop with that yes one right uh, now. there's a councillor that I at least that. one that wants My to comment wants uh to councillor Durley. thank you mr mayor again with the operating budget we have to keep in mind that as we're growing there's going to be needs for more equipment with for more people because we're going to be doing mm -hmm. kilometers more of roads and sidewalks and and a lot of maintenance there so in fact we need to uh perhaps get our eyes open to a point in the future when we're gonna deal with these things we know we're going to have to and build a reserve or do something that makes sure that we're prepared to do that because it's a necessity it's going to happen it can't be avoided so let's prepare ourselves i think that's a very important part of you know projecting a you know five-year operating requirement standard or, or something to that effect but i'm you know pass that on to staff as you come forward with with some ideas as far as operating is concerned because it's like i say it's it's coming and we're going to need to face it so thank you okay thank you anyone else on that on that item councillor pat just could, i i want to have more debate about that not debate but discussion about that because we need to uh, picking up if we establish a certain standard of service that we want to achieve different components are required to achieve it in some cases you may need the requirements additional st of, of staff along those lines in other cases you may need contracted services so i think it's a very good because what we're saying to the communities our level of standard is not here it's here right and in order to get there we need several different components to be brought into place so i'll be looking forward i know there's a report coming back to us mr ceo on staffing requirements and resources and picking up with the council durians also being cognizant of what we're faced with down the road you're right Councilor Chris, because not everybody's just going to accept and say, oh, you know, we can increase the budget and increase taxes and we'll take on more staff. That has to be thinking that other areas, that particularly I'm thinking of where we talked about in certain areas of public works, I have noticed that there things have been kind of, they haven't been able to do the work. And it's not a disrespect. Just yeah. You haven't had the resources to do it. So somewhere, if you can build that in, and I think we need a full-fledged discussion on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Just to just to build on that, I think I think I mentioned this when um, when staff made a, a presentation to us, and they were kind of doing a what you know a person to person comparison between Pelham and another municipality. Said this municipality has this many, and Pelham has this many staff. Um, you know, we have to be careful in those in those comparisons because that other municipality that was used in that case, um, and I'll just use this in general. <laughs> You know builds their own roads right sort of thing and has right. the equipment to do that we don't do that we contract that out so we feel at our service level that it's fine and it's good to contract out the construction of roads uh, sidewalks etc so where's that sweet spot uh, for other services right um, now sometimes staff are doing the extra things uh, and we've and the director has reported on that over the last uh, year or so talking about and staff took ownership over this particular item did it um, thinking of the frozen frozen water main they figured out another way to do it and and, and all that and saved the municipality money right so uh, in the innovative way that they did that so there is that how do you get to that happy medium how do you get to that sweet spot that innovation on that and I trust that staff are working on that i know they're coming forward with with some sort of report um i don't know if it's this month or next month but uh and i'll get you to comment in a sec but they are they are working on it based on the discussion that we had but you're right in terms of the you know the service levels that are expected in our community um we heard this evening and the themes that were there were about making our community even better even more beautiful um, so I don't know how many other communities that you'd have an open meeting and and people would come and talk about that. Those are great things to talk about. So it's because of the community that we have and the volunteers that we have and 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 the residents that we have. So those are Mr. Mayor, with my mate. Those are the attributes that Richard Flora talked to you about, mm -hmm. and that's what he's trying to say. Is right. no matter how you adapt to be resilient, 
to be adaptive. That's why people you heard that have been here three or four years, why are they coming here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The beauty, the level of service, the, I mean, that's all part of it. So we got to figure out what's the best way of doing that, keeping it within a, how say, reasonable affordability. Exactly. Is that? Right. Yeah. That's, that's all I'm saying. Thank you. Mr. CEO, anything on the timing of that report? Well, we're uh, just looking at the staffing requirements. Obviously, you referenced an interdepartmental team that, that made a presentation, and that, that work is being carried on and, can, and will be uh, a part of the operating budget, and we'll make a report back to Council on what the recommendations are for increased staffing, if any, uh, this particular area. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else on that? No. Okay. So I look forward to that. It's obviously an important, uh, important topic. Councilor so Kersey, I think you had one more, Last if my point. count is uh, correct, and then I'll it's invite others if there are any. Last point. Um, apart from the financing costs for the PCC, I think we need to be cognizant of any increase beyond the cost there. And what I mean by that is if staff chooses to bring forward a zero-based budget, then the implication there is that we are reducing services because if inflation is at one or two or three percent and we go to a zero based and there's lots of experts that that speak to this you are in effect taking a step backwards with respect to service levels so if in fact that comes forward then i think we need to have a justification on how the same service levels would be maintained with a zero base yeah. budget apart from debt service. Right. Exactly. So it's just, <clears throat> I, I just think we need to be, and maybe that's not even in, within the realm of possibility, but I'm just putting it out there. We, do, we don't normally say we want it 2% or we want it 3% or whatever. I'm just saying zero base is a step back unless we understand why. So I just put it out there for discussion purposes, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, the treasurer wants to I respond, and then on, she's <laughs> anxious to respond. So, <laughs> through you, Mr. The Mayor, treasurer. just just as council is aware for the budget impact meeting, like you know, I'm already hearing the external environment. So we know there are some significant increases that are coming forward. One particularly from the library, one from the airport. Our benefit program and Omer's program are coming forward with increases as well. So that doesn't even take into consideration any staff compensation, any new staffing. Um, so these are the things that I like to bring forward at that November meeting so then you have a clear understanding of exactly where we are already at before we even had any requests from staff on increasing service levels with respect to materials, supplies, right. equipment, th those kind of things in the operating budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Others to that item? I just want to build on that. I think they're small items. Councillor Papp, you mentioned about some of the service levels, um, things like uh, poop bags or uh, um, trails, maintenance, etc. I think it's important because I think when council approves the operating budget, we assume that the service levels are the same as they were or the same as they are, unless there's a change coming forward. And I think. I would just say that if something changes, it should come to council for, with a report to say, by the way, this is what we're facing, and here's the decision that we're recommending as opposed, you know. So I, th I think I've underscored that, that um, that's an important thing when we talk about the operating budget. Really, what is the service level that we're, that we're trying that we'll be able to achieve through that is it a decrease is it an increase is it a change and if invariably it's going to be a change one service area to another but i think we should have that discussion about what that means uh, because i think the assumption is from a council perspective that if it's here's the budget here it is this you know and the it's the same service level so if it isn't we need to know and if it changes mid-year if it changes year to year we should have the discussion about it. Um, interesting that uh, the treasurer indicated that some, I'll call them ABCs, like the library or the airport are coming forward with different changes. You know, some of the things that we've talked about on the operating side, I hope, uh, I know Councillor Kersey are on the, on the one ABC, I hope they're looking at that. And again, the, the idea of... Uh, alternatives, contracting out, volunteers, which we've spoke about around this council table. Mm -hmm. 
for um, so I hope that other others are looking at those uh, items as well and we'll have a probably a good discussion about that on the 14th of November. Councillor Drilly, did you want to add to that? No, I'm please. fine. I'm sorry, I thought you saw that. Anyone else on any other items regarding the uh, the various budgets? Okay. I look forward to uh, um, having, you know, moving forward with this budget. I really do appreciate the feedback from the community mm -hmm. uh, on this. And, and I think um, hopefully as we go through the budget, that maybe we can achieve some of the, there's that other tick box on criteria. Hopefully we can achieve some of the requests from members of the public. Some of them are small, yet important obviously to members of the public. Um, some of them will take some consideration from council if it's a capital item like a splash pad, which is in there in future. Um, you know, when's, when's the, the right timing uh, for the community on that? I will say there was another letter that uh, we'll get to council somehow that somehow the gremlins um, didn't get. It was in a different format and unfortunately the clerk couldn't read it and, and uh, so I apologize to council. It was a letter from a business in the Uptown Font Hill area that was requesting an entranceway from those shops in the back uh, into that development in behind the, uh, the fire hall. On so Highway 20, I call it Uptown Font Hill. Some of those businesses there on the on the north side are at least one business is suggesting that there be a link mid block uh, with the development in behind, and that's what the letter speaks to. So you'll see that as it comes. It'll probably go to council just for information that we'll forward to the budget. But there's a park that's planned there, I think, in uh, in a couple of years, and they're encouraging us to uh, to move consideration of that up so that there can be a link with those residents that have just moved into, uh, mm -hmm. into town. So I wanted to highlight that for you. Councillor Drilly? Yes, uh, just to sum everything up, I think the, the difficult stuff can be done soon and the impossible stuff might have to wait till next week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Drilly. <laughs> that took long for you to say. <laughs> Can we use that as her criteria? So it has been moved. <laughs> thank you. It has been moved by <laughs> Councillor King. Be it resolved, the special meeting of committee of the whole be adjourned until the next regular meeting scheduled for October seventeenth, two thousand sixteen, at six thirty p.m. Thank you again to all who participated. We'd encourage uh, residents uh, to continue to give us ideas and feedback for the budget. And I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion is carried. And this meeting is adjourned. Thanks to all who participated.